when a Chun Li analyzes the qualities that you bring to mindfulness practice, and by extension to concentration practice. He singles out ardency as the wisdom factor, which is interesting. It's the fact that that has to do with effort, the effort you put into being mindful and being, gaining concentration. Trying to see into your defilements. It's the ardency that does this, and the ardency is the wisdom they're realizing that this is something really worth doing, worth doing well. So working at the skill that's involved. That's the kind of discernment the Buddha was talking about, strategic discernment. The discernment in action. Because after all, as he points out, there some kinds of happiness are not noble, others are noble. And among the ignoble forms of happiness, there are gradations. So the question is, which ones are worth pursuing, which ones are not? Because happiness doesn't just come floating to you or washing up on shore. It's something you have to bring about. This is very different from the popular notion of Buddhism. There's a book I read recently, a History of Humankind. That devoted a few pages to Buddhism, and basically interpreted the Buddhist take on happiness as there are pleasant moments and there are unpleasant moments, and you have to learn how to accept that that's the way things are, and your acceptance gives a certain amount of peace. The image the author gave was sitting on a shore, and the waves come in. And there are good waves and there are bad waves. You just accept to accept the fact that that's the way the ocean is. It's beyond your control. And wisdom lies in learning to accept the fact that waves will come and then they will go away. In other words, pleasures and pains are fleeting, so don't get worked up about them, which is very defeatist and totally missing the point that there are gradations of happiness, and some happiness is long-term, some is short-term. I've often mentioned that question that the Buddha says lies at the basis of wisdom or discernment. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. And I've pointed out that the wisdom there lies in seeing that long-term is better than short-term, and that happiness does depend on your actions. But there's another point as well, right? recognizing that there is such a thing as long-term and short-term to begin with. It's not that everything just is as evanescent as others to do. Some forms of happiness really last for a long term, and they are conducive to gaining the noble happiness that comes with full awakening. Those are really worth pursuing, and they're worth putting a lot of effort in to gaining. And one of the hallmarks of long-term happiness is that it's harmless as well. As the Buddha points out, if your happiness harms other people, they're not going to stand for it. In fact, realizing that there was such a thing as a harmless happiness, that was what enabled him to undertake the path. Because he saw, as he said, everybody was struggling for happiness, just like fish in a dwindling stream, fighting one another for little bit of water that was there, harming one another in the process, and then dying as an as end result, accomplishing nothing at all but creating a lot of misery for one another. And he wondered, is there such a thing as a happiness that doesn't require taking things away from people who are possessive? Is there a happiness that doesn't require conflict? And that's what he was looking for. That first answer to that question of what money do I lead to my long-term welfare and happiness is the practice of merit. As the Buddha said, acts of merit are another word, another word for happiness. Again, here's the action there is the operative word here. It's in doing the generosity and in doing 
the practice of virtue and doing the development of goodwill and other forms of meditation. That's where the happiness lies. And it's not just a happiness for people who don't want to go further in the path. To get further in the path, you have to go through these stages, through these practices. One, simply as a John Sawat noted, when he notes a lot of Western meditators looking awfully grim on a meditation retreat, he said it's become, because they haven't had really good experience with the Buddhist teachings on generosity and virtue, to give a sense of well-being, to give a sense of confidence in his teachings and in yourself, realizing that this is for the sake of happiness, and you really can create happiness. What's especially good about the practice of merit is you realize that you can create goodness inside yourself. That's a genuine basis for self-esteem, not little gold stars that your teacher gives you. Realizing that it wasn't all that easy, but you can do it. It's not that we're innately good or innately bad, but we have a mixture of things inside us, and so it's going to be a struggle. Generosity is not always easy. The precepts are not always easy. Having goodwill for everybody is not easy. And when you can manage it, you've learned a lot of skills and you've developed that sense that, yes, you can create goodness from within you. And there's a really solid sense of self-esteem that comes from that. At the same time, of course, the practice of merit prepares you for the Four Noble Truths, because the Four Noble Truths are all about what you do, and that some things you do are more skillful than others. The cause of suffering is something you do. You crave, you cling. The path is something you do. You develop all the factors from a right view all the way through to right concentration to overcome that tendency to crave and to cling. These are all things we're doing, and we want to learn how to do them well, or to learn how to abandon the unskillful side of the Four Noble Truths and develop that more skillful side. But you get practice with the practice of merit. The path requires restraint. Well, that's what you'll learn in the development of virtue and you learn in the development of a good universal, unlimited goodwill. It requires ingenuity, and that too comes from the practice of merit. You you find ingenious ways of being generous. Sometimes you don't have much in terms of material wealth or other things you can give. And this is the part of the practice where you can show your creativity, what you would like to give to other people, what goodness you would like to give rise to in the world. There's mindfulness involved in remembering, say, a precept, alertness and watching over your actions to make sure that you do follow the precept and the ardency that's involved in trying to do it well. Realizing there are times when, you're in observing the precept, you might be in danger of, say, telling a truth that would someone else would abuse. So how do you learn how not to lie and yet still not get that information across? That requires ingenuity, requires discernment. Or how do you figure out how to deal with pests? I lived once with a monk who, when he was a layperson, had been a hunter. He talked about what it was like trying to psych out the animals. That was interesting. He seemed to have a lot of sympathy for them, and then of course they knew he went ahead and killed them. But if you're taking the precepts, then you have to learn how to have sympathy for the animals as well. That means not just being nice to them, but figuring out how can we live together so that they don't get into spaces where you don't want them to go. You've got to think about their psychology. Learn to understand them. It's a real lesson in empathy, observing the precepts. In the practice of Developing goodwill. As the Buddha said, it is a form of mindfulness. It's something you have to determine. It doesn't come from your innately good nature. It comes from the potentials you have for having goodwill for some beings, and you have to learn how to extend it to all beings. 
which requires mindfulness. You have to keep remembering that in the face of some sometimes very bad behavior. How to maintain goodwill in spite of that. And it requires discernment, remembering that happiness does come from actions. And so when you're extending goodwill to somebody, it means you're wishing that they would understand the causes for true happiness and be able to act on them. Which, when you understand that, makes it a lot easier to have goodwill for everybody. So in the practice of merit, it prepares you for understanding the Four Noble Truths. When the Buddha would explain the Four Noble Truths, often he would preface it with what he called the graduated discourse, talking first about generosity and then virtue, the rewards of generosity and virtue. And only when he was secure in those ideas would he be willing to talk about, well, these are the drawbacks. Some people go straight for the drawbacks and say, well, in that case I'm not going to bother with virtue or generosity, but that's not how, but how the Buddha meant it to be trained. You've got to train in these things and taste their rewards so you're ready for the Four Noble Truths. Because you've learned the skills of knowing how to make sacrifices, knowing how to be ingenious, gaining some restraint. That's another aspect of goodwill that we often overlook, in learning the restraint, the patience that are required for goodwill. That's going to be part of learning how to master the Four Noble Truths, because they do carry duties. They're not just truths that sit there on the paper. They're categories for experience in which carry duties. And we're used to the fact that we're here for understanding action and realizing that some actions are more worthwhile than others because they lead to a happiness that's more worthwhile than others. That's when you're ready for the Four Noble Truths. So there are gradations in what kind of happiness is worthwhile and what kind of happiness is not. And even though some forms of happiness may not be all the way to the noble level of the deathless happiness, still there are some that are conducive on the path that you give rise to. So that you can give rise to mindfulness. And mindfulness then reminds you to give rise to skillful qualities of all kinds. It's not just there watching things coming and going away. When the Buddha talks about mindfulness as a governing principle, it means giving rise to good qualities that are not there yet and then preventing them from falling away. So the mind can get into concentration. It can taste a, a happiness that's on a higher level more lasting, more solid, which can then form the basis for the rest of the path getting strengthened so it can take you all the way to the deathless happiness. So there are gradations in happiness, and it's a skill to understand that and be able to give rise to them. Which is why John Lee said that it's the discernment lies in that ardency is we need to do this well, and then figuring out how to do it well. Because if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And if you're wise enough to want to do it, then you're ready for the path.